Welcome to, I guess it's week four now in the uh, Change Open Online course. We have a real pleasure today to hear from Allison Littlejohn, who is with the Caledonian Academy. I had the pleasure last December to visit Allison, Anoush, Colin, and colleagues within the university and uh, fascinating some of the things that they're doing there and certainly the energy and the enthusiasm that they have for exploring different ways in which technology is influencing teaching and learning. We also had the pleasure to host Allison uh, last summer actually at uh, the Technology Enhanced Knowledge Research Institute here at Athabasca University and uh, she along with Anusha and Colin came out for a seminar that we were doing on uh, social networks and learning. Uh, coincidentally we actually had uh, Stephen Downs out that same week as well well, so that was kind of a neat uh, connection there. But a uh, big fan of the, the work and thinking of Allison and the activity that she's been involved with, in, both in taking the uh, role of learning technologies forward in higher education sector, but she's also been quite active in connecting with companies and organizations such as Shell, for example, looking at informal learning. So I think there's a focus in Allison's view of learning that exceeds the breadth of a higher education model but starts to move into more broadly into uh, different life settings. So on that note, Allison, I'll throw it over to you. Welcome here. Thank you very much, George. It's great uh, to be here in this session, and it's been fantastic um, participating in the MOOC and having the opportunity to facilitate this week. Um, so the focus of this week has been on collective learning, and it's an interesting concept because it's really an old idea revisited in the context of social media. Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, reading people's ideas around it. Um, now, the, the presentation that I was going to give in the live session the other day has actually been uh, available for people to to look at on online. So I'd like to ask how many people have actually seen the session online, so they get an idea of how many people have not seen the session. So please raise your hand and eliminate if you have seen the session. Okay, so one person out of 34, two. Okay, well, more people raising their hands. What I'm going to do today then, then is to go through the, the presentation, but maybe have a little bit more conversation around it. And uh, one of my colleagues, Lou McGill, is going to keep an eye on the back chat and uh, summarize some of the questions and ideas so that we can look at them. So throughout the week, we've been thinking about collective learning, and we've had a number of different tasks I'm going to reflect on. I'm going to uh, talk about some of the comments that we've had on those tasks. As George mentioned, um, a lot of our research at the moment is in the context of corporate or professional learning, so in corporate contexts. And one of the things I've been thinking about is, is collective learning appropriate across a broader range of contexts than corporate contexts? For example, is it appropriate for higher education learning? Um, does it signal a new learning paradigm? Or is it really too complex and unstructured to be useful for learning um, outside the corporate context? But one of the things I was thinking about when I think about learning in universities um, was uh, an image by one of my favorite artists, Banksy. Um, for those of you who know Banksy, he's a street artist who uh, originates from London, but he pops up all over the world and does some paintings. And this is the, the Banksy painting that made me think about um, learning in universities. And what I feel is that anything that signals real change rather than superficial change seems to be discouraged and countercultural and seems to conflict with some of the standards that we have within higher education. So I was thinking, is a faster change in the corporate sector because the drivers there are very different? So the question is, why collective learning? And I think within society, there are a number of trends that point us towards collective learning as being possibly useful and possibly helpful in some situations. Um, the trends are that some of the problems that we have in society are very big and need a lot of people 
able to solve those problems. And the expertise to solve the problems seems to be distributed across uh, various different uh, silos of knowledge. So here's another Banksy pain painting that makes me think about some of the environmental issues that we have. The knowledge is out there, and we need multidisciplinary teams to work together to try to solve some of these problems. So the problems are becoming more complex, and expertise is becoming distributed. So we need some way of collectively bringing the knowledge together to solve these problems. Now, one of the things I'd like to say is that some of the comments in the blogs has questioned this idea about technology being a driver. In the position paper, I said technology is a driver for bringing knowledge together to solve large, complex problems. And what I meant there was it's not the, the social networking technologies or the learning technologies that are the driver. It's the technologies that we need to solve the big problems. So for example, the environmental problems. Or in healthcare, how do we find new healthcare solutions? Or with the energy sector, um, we have done a number of projects with Shell, and they're always telling us they need to source the disco oil. So these are the kind of technology problems that need the big solutions. OK, so um, something I read a couple of years ago, a book called Multitude by Hart and Negri, really influenced my thinking. And one of the key messages from that book is that we the the trends that we have have led to what Hart and Negri call a growth in immaterial labor, so work that has knowledge as output. So many of us are actually carrying out work and creating knowledge. So work patterns have changed. Instead of having closed, localized, industry-type, factory-type ways of working, we have open and distributed ways of working that are more suited towards uh, the creation of knowledge. And a number of different reports, the IBM Global Human Capital Study and other reports, um, including McKinsey's studies, are saying that the key to solving some of the issues that industry faces is learning, having a workforce that can adapt to some of these new and big problems. So here's a big, grand challenge. We need to learn how to solve yeah. real-world problems faster and more effectively. So we need to um, think about how to do things differently. We need some kind of new okay paradigm. To me. And maybe some of the examples from industry people. are influenced uh, by some of the drivers of the that there are in industry. industry. So what I'd like to do is to think people. about some of these questions. So here are some of the key questions, and these are related to the tasks that we've had each day. So first, how do people make sense of the collective knowledge, and what are the binding forces that draw people and resources together? And those two questions have been related to task two, where we were thinking about sense making, and I've presented um, some of our ideas about how learners can actually navigate and make sense of the collective knowledge through a process that we've termed charting. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, how do people use collective knowledge for learning? So yesterday's task, task three, was looking at how knowledge workers learn. Um, and we put up some ideas about how people learn in the corporate sector and how they use collective knowledge. That's based on some of our work with Shell and how people use the global knowledge networks for learning and to solve work problems. And then uh, what literacy and mindsets do people need for collective learning? Because I think um, one of the often overlooked problems is we need to make sure that any learning solutions that we put in place can actually be used by learners. And if people don't have the, the, the self-regulation mindsets, then they're going to find it very difficult to engage in collective learning. 
So that was related to task four, which is looking at practices and literacies that learners acquire for collective learning. How do they interact with the collective knowledge and what literacies do they need to use the collective knowledge? Okay, so moving forward, if we think about how people make sense of the collective knowledge, we know that learning involves making sense of the available knowledge and reinterpreting it in a way that fits with the learner's current knowledge framework. And central to this is the idea of meaning making. So that's connecting, disconnecting, and reconnecting knowledge fragments through knowledge creation. So as learners travel a learning pathway, they need to navigate and make sense of the available knowledge resources. And you know, George Siemens calls this connectivism. And connections is a fundamental, but uh, connectivism is about more than simply making connections. So a key question is what discrete actions make up these sense-making processes? So some of my collaborators and I have been researching how people use collective knowledge to help them learn at work. Anush Markaya and Colin Milligan and I looked at the learning behaviours of experts and novices in different disciplines in a multinational company. And what we found was that making connections is very important, it's fundamental. But people don't just connect. To benefit from that knowledge, they actually have to use it as well. We call it consume. So they have to rethink that knowledge in a way that makes sense to them. At work, what people do is they connect the knowledge and they use it within their work tasks. And in doing so, they themselves create knowledge resources. And these knowledge resources could be anything from reports that can be uploaded to the collective, or it could be the ways in which people carry out some of their tasks. So the traces of what they do can be uploaded to the collective knowledge. So they contribute back to the collective. And we looked at these four knowledge actions and we thought about how people actually make sense of the collective knowledge. And we termed this charting. So charting is a sense-making process. It involves individuals connecting with the collective through consuming, connecting, creating, and contributing. What I'd like to do is stop at this point and actually think about some of the comments that people have been making in, in the blogs around each of these different areas. Because one of the issues that was highlighted in terms of um, connecting are the power issues around cultural and geopolitical issues. I think it was Michael Brook who brought up this very important issue. So what are the power relationships when people actually create knowledge? That in itself is not neutral. So one of the things I'd like to to talk about are um, what, what are your thoughts about some of these power issues? And from our perspective, we did actually find that when we looked at how novices and experts um, share knowledge within a company, that there are some, some issues. Sometimes the experts were actually acting as novices, particularly when they were in transition. For example, if someone went into a, a management type role, they were then going from being an expert, perhaps a technical expert, to being a novice. And yet, in their role, they're viewed as an expert. So what were the incentives for them to contribute their knowledge to the global knowledge networks? And how did they feel in terms of being exposed to the global knowledge networks? So any thoughts about um, this idea of collective learning and how it might impact on power relationships? OK, well, another issue um, that was raised in terms of connecting is, uh, is around this idea of a binding force. Because one of the things that we were trying to investigate is, is a goal, is someone's learning goal possibly something that brings people together? And a comment that was made was, why would this binding force be different from what binds people together in different kinds of relationships outside of collective learning? I think this is a very good question. But um, I also think that 
when we're in the collective knowledge space and we have the opportunities of using social media, it actually means that we can bind together in different kinds of ways. So um, again, if anyone has any comments that they would like to make about, uh, about sense-making processes and binding, then please raise your hand and say something now. Alison, it might be uh, interesting to see how people uh, how, how people use objects or uh, or resources to connect with each other. So maybe uh, if we could ask how people use the resources that they get from their communities and their networks, and uh, either have them put the uh, the comment in the chat window or take the mic and contribute. Okay, one of the discussions that um, we had earlier um, with Lou McGill was whether something like an open educational resource could be a, a social object that can be used to bind people together. Uh, for example, if a number of different people are working I, on I'm wondering what you mean exactly by binding. Uh, because obviously we're not tying them up with ropes. Bind people together. So <laughs> So, so when you say you know X binds Y, what, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is um, the object around which people collaborate and carry out some kind of task. Therefore, the driver is the task. So you're, you're actually you're saying binding out. is the same as collaboration. Well, the the binding is the the activity that drives people towards collaboration. So it's the activity that people are actually engaged in. Maybe I could give some examples. Sure. Um, If I go through these slides, I actually have some examples. So for example, um, there's this idea of the social object, which has come from social cultural theory. And the idea is that people create knowledge by working in networks and connecting via social objects. So a simple example of this in formal education is um, the UK Open University iSpot site where um, it's a site where people upload pictures of flowers that they find in the countryside and expert botanists go into the site and help people uh, by sharing their knowledge on, on what these flowers and, and so on are. So the idea here is that botanists explore plant growth and connect by uploading photos to iSpot. But from the corporate sector, a more complex example is that professionals in the energy sector who, during the Gulf oil spill, were trying to build a novel solution. We're working on the problem via a global knowledge network. So here, the social object is the, the solution. So the binding force is here is the activity that people are trying to carry out and they're actually working together on a social object. 
So if I go back, this actually relates to um, to the idea of of how people would use the collective knowledge while learning. So when we were working with um, with Shell, we actually devised a scenario of what collective learning might look like, and this will show the kinds of um, binding forces that there would be. So if if we have uh, someone who's working as a chemist, for example, who's trying to find a new coolant substrate for, for a drilling rig, then her goal is to find this new cooling substrate. What she will do is she'll seek out the knowledge resources to help her develop this new cooling substrate. And she'll also call on some of the, the people that she works with. That could be a manager or a team or colleagues, peers, even people outside the company. Now, she as an individual is likely to work in groups. Simultaneously, she'll draw on the network, but she'll also draw on the collective as well. So we, we're not working as an individual or a group or a network or a collective. We're doing all of those at the same time. She consumes the knowledge within the resources and within the people by, you know, by using the knowledge. Um, she connects with those people and knowledge resources. And while using the knowledge resources, she creates new knowledge and contributes that back to the collective. So these are the four knowledge actions uh, that I mentioned earlier. And if there are other people, either within her organization or perhaps in another organization, who are trying to achieve a similar goal or who in the past achieved a similar goal, then she can go through her learning path to try and reach her goal with these people. So in other words, she is working with other people whom she may be in direct contact with or, or maybe not. So in this sense, we have a knowledge creation approach to learning where people are actually creating learning resources that could be used by others. And um, Pavla talks about this as a third learning paradigm. So instead of thinking about learning as either individual or social, and we can think about learning as individual and social at the same time. And the idea is that the social technologies bring together the individual with the collective. Now, one of the, the points that's been raised in, in some of the blog posts over the last week is this issue of making everything available. Does this help or hinder learning? Um, and I think this is quite an important point because it's very easy to get lost in a sea of all the knowledge that's available. So one of the things that we need is better searching and better learning analytics so that we can find the resources that we need so that we have an understanding of the resources that can actually be helpful for us. So we've been looking at the idea of a learning goal as being this um, social object that people work around and of systems that help with charting so that people can achieve their goals much better. So the idea is that um, if I know what my learning goal is, the ideal situation is that everything that I do in my work or my learning can help me achieve my goal. So every piece of um, knowledge that I find and everything I do will help me move closer towards my goal. But in reality, that's not how things happen. And sometimes I can be pulled in one direction or another. And actually, my goals are likely to evolve over time. So we've been looking at the idea of a, a charting system, which would be a tool set drawing on social technologies that would help the individual figure out where he or she is and where they want to be. And the idea is that by drawing on the knowledge that's out there and the traces that other people leave, that people can achieve their goals, that they can be directed towards useful resources and useful people. So I'm, I'm I've been very interested in what people's 
reaction is to this idea Allison, of where charting. Where do you get the term charting? Where does that come from? It sounds very to similar to what I would understand by analytics. Various different tools that could be helpful for charting. So this is a question to people. Are there tools and resources that you know of help with the charting? Uh, yeah, I mean, the the idea of charting or the term charting um, is something that we invented, I guess, um, while we were working with Shell because we had these four knowledge actions which are connecting, consuming, creating, contributing. So uh, working in the corporate sector, uh, we wanted a, a, a nice word that seemed to fit with that and charting seemed to be a good idea. But actually we've had a lot of discussions about charting and the kind of ideas that that conveys to people because sometimes it can seem that we go directly from point A to point B almost on a map. But actually, charting is a much more dynamic process. It's simply a, a way of making sense of the collective knowledge, and that's not necessarily going to be a linear process. So perhaps charting well, is not quite the right term to um, use. Me being me, I always take anything anyone else says well, and map it that. to what I think. So, <laughs> so I'm sitting here drawing connections. <laughs> between what you do and what I do and, and trying to find the similarities. That's just I'm very self-centered in that way. Um, but uh, if George is still with us, George has actually focused quite a bit on analytics and uh, might be able to weigh in here on uh, the relation between analytics and charting. Me, uh, oh, Right now, I'm sort of stuck on two questions. Uh, one question, because you've referred to collective knowledge, uh, and you've referred to the uh, networks and collectives. Uh, back a number of years ago, I went on for a long time about the distinction between groups and networks, and then Anderson and Drawn reacting to that came up with groups, networks, and collectives. I've never been happy with that uh, because in my mind, they've never defined what they mean by collectives as distinct from network. So I'd be curious to see if you have an account of what makes networks or collectives different from networks and if there's a difference between collective knowledge and network knowledge. Uh, yeah, and then I'll leave the second one for later. Following if you your, gap. your debates around uh, the ideas of groups, networks, and collectives, and um, yeah, I think I've been quite influenced by uh, John and Terry's paper. That's John Drawn and Terry Anderson's paper on how the crowd can teach. Um, I quite like how they define groups, networks, and collectives. Our take on collectives is that um, you know, a collective could be something like, um, I don't know, um, delicious bookmarks, for example. So those uh, could point me towards the kind of knowledge that I need to know. Um, so I'm very loosely bound to those because I, I, I can use these uh, bookmarks without actually knowing the person or the people who've left the, the bookmarks. Um, whereas a group is likely to be a collection of people that, that I know or that I have some greater connection with. Yeah, but what's the difference between delicious and a network? Not, who Does cares about groups? Your I, I just want to see the difference um, between collectives and networks. Yeah, well, to me, the difference between a, a network and a collective would be, I mean, the delicious bookmarks are a kind of aggregation of people's choices, whereas a network is, uh, you know, a sort of connection of choices. So maybe a better example would be a recommender system where you have um, lots of people making recommendations as to a choice, a book, or a, a, a direction that you might take. To me, that is a collective rather than a network.
what's your view on that? Okay, one of the uh, distinctions that I drew between uh, a group and a network is that uh, a group is defined by the mass, by the counting, and a network is defined by the connections uh, between the members. So now when you're saying it's like a recommender system, you're saying it's like a group. So now you're distinguishing the network from connecto collective. To me, it sounds like you're distinguishing a network from group. Well, to me, within a group, there would be more um, more connection. I might know the people in the group, or I would have some kind of identity with them. Whereas, um, if I'm using a recommender system, I, I probably have no knowledge at all about the people who made those choices. Um, so, to me, that is the, the distinction. Um, I know there's been a lot of debate over groups, networks, and collectives, um, and I think you know when, when we talk about collective learning, we don't only mean people working in collectives. We we really are talking about capitalising on all these different ways in which people might work together. So I suppose for for us, we haven't really worried so much about. Uh, precise definitions of, of each of these. Would any of my um, any of the people who are working in this area like to 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 make And if comments? no one does, George is ready to weigh in on analytics as well. Uh, great. Great. Well um, on that note and I, I should mention I did post it in the text area too. Uh, we do have both Terry and John coming up later in this open course and they can uh, help to clarify at least some of their perspectives on the groups, networks and collectives. As I mentioned, I know with a, a recent paper that I uh, saw that uh, John and Terry uh, have in review right now, uh, they've actually changed their terminology slightly and I think have uh, sort of clarified a little bit of the distinctions. So uh, this, this is a discussion that as Stephen noted has been ongoing for uh, about three plus years, four years, in terms of the uh, networks groups distinction. And so it'll be, I think, good to hear how they define as they move forward. So I, I don't want to minimize the importance of that discussion, but I just want to you know, emphasize that we'll be having that again as the course progresses. Now, one of the things that they probably uh, need to spend some little bit of time thinking about, or that we at least need to, is this role of analytics and concept uh, frameworks and what you, Allison has called charting. And I just want to emphasize, I mean, my whole interest in analytics is driven from a perspective of, uh, you know, connectivism or network learning. And this is one of the reasons why I have been, you know, students of courses uh, do concept maps uh, as a guarantee. Some people hate them, but really when you think of it, much of learning, and you're touching on this with this concept of charting a little bit, Allison, but much of learning is really about us encountering different concepts and bringing those concepts in relation to one another which means if we, let's say, have a certain view of social justice, there is a possibility, uh, more than a possibility, there is a very real prospect that concepts will resonate with us differently if we have a social justice view of the world than if we, let's say, have a you know, strong individualistic, what's sometimes termed as you know, the, the market view of the world. So the fact that we have certain frameworks of understanding and as we try to make sense of new entities, we need to account for things such as resonance, which is why do we have this disposition to accept certain new ideas over others. And this is where I think this notion of analytics becomes important because it's one lens, not the only one, but it's one lens that we can use to understand how learning develops. And I think there does seem to be a linkage to what you're talking about as a charting perspective as well, even though you, I think you're looking at it from a very specific context, which seems to be a little bit more in a, uh, shell or in a corporate context. So I'm not sure if that clarifies at all the role of analytics versus charting. Okay, thank you very much for that, George. And um, one of the areas we want to look at today are the kinds of literacies and, and mindsets that people need for collective learning because learning is about people and I think we can often get 
caught up in the, the processes and the tools and not actually think about the the people and, and the, the impact that that can have. And um, in the posi position paper today, I've been thinking about John Seeley Brown's ideas of the learning ecosystem. You know, he wrote his paper in 2008, so it's, it's not new. The idea here is that knowledge resources flow within a collective knowledge space, and John Seeley Brown talks about the OER movement, the Open Educational Resources Movement, as one of the most visible changes in formal education. And he talks about this move towards an open participatory learning ecosystem where knowledge resources dynamically shift within the system. Um, but what does that actually mean in terms of, of learning and does this signal a, such a new environment for learning that learners might um, have to develop literacies to, to work within this kind of environment? So, we don't yet understand the different types of resources and how these might support collective learning and knowledge building. But one of the areas of research that we've been taking forward um, is in the area of open educational resources. So for the past couple of years, we've been working with a program that's funded by the Joint Information and Systems Committee in the UK. Um, this has been a multi-million pound project uh, working with um, 40 projects, 40 universities in the first year and uh, over 20 in the second year, looking at how they actually release open educational resources. And the reason that we think this fits with this idea of a, a participatory learning ecosystem is because these resources themselves um, are very dynamic and we have to think about um, not just how are they used in formal learning but perhaps even more important, importantly um, how are they actually created, how are they used, reused, adapted and what does that mean in terms of, of this whole idea of collective learning. One of the things we've identified are what we call benefits models. So these are the factors that that drive the release of these open, open educational resources. And we've come up with these benefits models here. So one of the reasons why people might want to release open educational resources is individual showcasing. For example, if, if a, an academic or an individual um, is a specialist in a particular area, then they might want to release these resources uh, as blogs or as some other kind of resource to showcase their ideas and showcase their work. At the same time, a lot of organizations, universities for example, have been engaging in institutional showcasing by producing open educational resources that either advertise courses that they offer or research. We've been working with um, Oxford on the Open Spires project where they podcast uh, research and there are lots of examples from universities around the world. Another reason is capacity building. So to release resources to help professional learning in a particular area. And share and share alike, this is a kind of altruistic driver. The idea that, that people actually want to release knowledge resources because they believe in this idea of not only using resources from other people, but making resources available for others to use. And then there's public interest. Um, this is particularly important for universities because they want to engage in it with the public um, and so to release resources through public interest. So I think that these benefits models that we've been looking at and we've been working with universities in uh, organizing change around these benefits models and I think this is um, an interesting perspective for the idea of collective learning and how we can drive 
forward the, the idea of knowledge sharing. Um, and again, I'll just take a minute or so to, to pause and ask if, if anyone has any any comments around this uh, open educational resources movement. I realise the back chat has been going on. I just wonder are there any ideas or points from there that maybe we should think about? Well, they've uh, sort of started lingering on the question of assessments, and uh, we've got uh, people talking about power, the power of assessment and where it lies in the hands of uh, educational management and educational ministries. And I think, um, I think in the corporate environment as well, assessment may play a significant role in shaping what the uh, what the connection between learners and resources looks like. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, the drivers in the corporate sector are different from the drivers in the formal education sector um, because the drive, we're assessed in different ways at work. I mean, in a sense, our assessment is how we perform in our job, so it's how do we complete the task. Whereas um, many of the assessments in formal education are, um, they're different in nature. So that has a profound influence on the way that people interact with the collective knowledge, because our goals are very different. So also, I think certainly in the UK and I'm noticing it in other countries as well that I think assessment rather than um, promoting the idea of people being self-regulated I actually think in universities in the UK assessment is holding back self-regulation because I think that often learners are learning how to pass the assessment which is very different from being a self-regulated learner any thoughts on that idea? Well, the uh, first time I saw that was in John Holt's uh, well-known book, How Children Fail, and it certainly seems to me that you're correct in observing that uh, changing the mode of assessment changes the behavior of the learner. I, th I think there's no question about that. And uh, we have someone here, uh, I think Norman, talking about the disempowerment of the learner in assessment situations. Do you think there's a, a direct connection between the empowerment of the learner and the capacity to learn? And if so, where do you think that would show up? Would it show up in, in connecting and consuming or creating or contributing? Where, where do you think we'd see that most of all? I think it's clear that empowerment of learners has a profound impact on learning. Um, I think connecting and consuming is what we often see in terms of formal education when people want to pass assessments. Whereas if we have a, a more open view of assessment, then people essentially have to create and, create and contribute knowledge as well. So, for example, if you're completing your work task or you're doing some kind of authentic learning with an authentic output, you would have to engage in all four knowledge actions of connecting, consuming, creating and contributing. And that's a driver towards towards this. However, um, I think that if learners are used to being in a, an environment or a formal education system that focuses mainly on connecting and consuming, then if they're put in, in a system which, which is completely different, has completely different drivers, that, that can, be, it can be very difficult for them to adapt to that. So I think it's very important that we think about changing education, making 
making sure that people are self-regulated from, from the very early stage, from uh, the primary education. Any thoughts about that from other people? Okay, maybe if I move on a little bit. Um, there, if we go forward with this idea of, of collective learning or learning in, in less structured environments, then there is a lot of responsibility on students and expectation that students or learners will actually create their own environments around themselves and that they will structure their own learning. And that, that's a very different landscape. It can be very difficult for learners. So some of the research that we've been doing, apologies, this slide isn't showing up very well, but it's to show some of the, the trends in knowledge practices. I really enjoyed the, um, the, the week three when Martin Weller was looking at some of the, the scholarship practices that we have. So we can see a shift from this idea of individual authority to shared ownership of the creation of knowledge. Uh, we've been carrying out some research into learner literacies and some of the research is actually raising questions around what do we mean by literacies, what constitutes literacies and how do they fit within learning and I think a lot of these ideas and issues were raised last week uh, during Martin's presentation. So question is, does collective learning signal a new relationship between the individual and the collective? Indeed, what is that relationship? I'm not convinced that we actually know what that relationship is. I think if we're actually having discussions about what do we mean by the group, the network, the collective, that there's some ambiguity about it. So again, I'm, I'm interested in, in any ideas or any thoughts that people might have about this relationship between individual and collective. One of the questions that was asked in one of the blogs was about the rewards. What's the value for an individual in the situations where they're creating knowledge for other people? If the individual is not recognized and given credit for the ideas, so if people don't feel that they're going to benefit from releasing knowledge, then why would they release the knowledge? I think that's a, it's a very good question and it's, it's an issue that's actually been raised in, in a number of the, the different areas that we've looked at. For example, the benefits models are all about how do people benefit Okay. Hi. Can you hear me, Alison? Yeah. Hi. It's uh, Lou, Lou McGillia. And um, one of the um, things that I was thinking about in our discussions over the week about collective learning was the um, that that I think there's a need to uh, almost um, let go of the individual when you start thinking about collective learning and collective knowledge and um, one of the challenges and one of the literacies I think that we have we face is knowing when to do that so knowing what the balance is in when it's important to sort of take that individual view and when it's important to be a part of the collective and and s sort of subsume yourself into the collective I don't know what you think about that Sorry, Lou, I couldn't really hear your question because the sound was uh, starting and stopping. Can you can you repeat it? Sorry. Sorry. Um. What what I so what I was thinking was that um. I think um one of the one of the things we need to do is to try and um work out the balance between when we should when we are an individual and when we sub, sub, subsume into the collective and to the, the collective side of things. So I think that um, I, mean, I, I, do, I, I can see in the chat that people are saying the individual always exists and that's, I'm not saying you're individual, you don't exist as an individual. I think Alison, you said earlier that you know we 
within within the collective, you're still an individual, but you're also a part of the collective. But you're also part of other collectives as well. But I think one of the one of the literacies that we need is an um, an awareness of that, an awareness of when it's important to be an individual, and an awareness of when you sometimes need to let go. Hi there. Uh, sorry, my audio was disabled just for a few seconds. I think that's a very good point, Lou. Um, I think in the thinking about collective learning, it's not that we either have the individual or the collective. The idea is the individual at all points exists within the collective. And what's the relationship between the individual and the collective? So we as individuals all have responsibilities, we all have roles to play, whether we're working with as an individual or within groups or networks or collectives. So it's about how do I learn as, a, as an individual? The learning happens within me, within my, my brain essentially, but in learning then I can draw on other people. I can draw on knowledge resources that are out there. So it's the relationship between those two things I think is, is important here. And um, just to go back to the idea that expertise is distributed nowadays and particularly when, when we're thinking about um, some of the higher level learning, for example learning at university or knowledge work. Uh, that's when people really have to, to go out and to find the knowledge that they need to solve these problems. It's less likely that knowledge will be in one place or that we can find it in one place. So that's the idea. We're not thinking about people not learning as individuals. We're just saying, well, how can they actually learn as individuals but draw from all the knowledge that's out there? So any other questions or ideas from the back chat? Well, we have, um, I think, three minutes to go or something like that. Um, so at the end of the day, um, I've put forward collective learning as an idea this week, just for discussion. I don't think it's a panacea and I don't think it's necessarily um, the way that all learning should be in the future, but I just think it provides some ideas that we should think about and, and possibly some future directions. So it could be that disruptor, certainly within the industry context, then the idea of bringing together knowledge into global knowledge networks has been a great driver for how people can, can share ideas. So it's a way of thinking and I'm very interested in how that connects with a lot of the other ideas that are going to be considered over the 30 weeks of the, of the MOOC and that would be very interesting. So um, any final comments, questions, ideas? Well, I'm going to jump in here. We do have you scheduled for tomorrow uh, at noon Eastern, uh, which would be, I believe, 5 p.m. Uh, British time. And I just want to confirm that that's still the case, because if so, we can certainly take the lingering questions we may have here into tomorrow's session. It's fine with me to have a, a live session if people would like to have a live session. And if we do, what I'd like to do is to ask people to send questions, maybe tweet, tweet some questions, and uh, we could think about those tomorrow. Okay, so for tomorrow's session then, uh, there's the, the onus on participants and uh, uh, we'll make sure that that's clear in the newsletter for people to come with their, their questions and their comments prepared. Because um, if they don't, I will. Nobody wants that. Okay. And one of the things we could do tomorrow is to sum up, to have some 
um, observations over the, the five different areas that we will look at during the week, so the five tasks. Absolutely, no question, we should do that. Okay. Um, George, I've, I've been, uh, oh, sorry, I, I just wanted to say, Alison, ahead. I've been keeping the track of the um, of the chat in the in the um, chat box and kind of grouping it into sort of areas, and I'll pass that on to you so that if there's anything in there you'd like to address um, directly, you can you could uh, take that up tomorrow as well. I haven't kind of highlighted in the specific issues because if not necessarily t as chat does, it, it hasn't necessarily followed in in relation to sort of what what you were saying when you were saying it, so um, it'll give you an opportunity to look at it and see see if there's anything you can bring back to it tomorrow. Brilliant, thanks. Thank you. All right then. Uh, then on uh, behalf of George, who tells me there's nothing else from him uh, in the chat area, uh, and, and on behalf of everybody in the Change Eleven MOOC. Massive open online course. I'd like to thank Allison and uh, Lou McGill for coming in and joining us. And we will see you all exactly 24 hours from now to continue this discussion. So thank you and so long from Change 11. <laughs>